everybody and welcome back to another episode of the Movie Scramble podcast. It's just myself and John this evening because we're not going to be discussing any new releases which are starting to come out that our cinemas have reopened, especially in Scotland. We've not looked at something, some classic from Prime or Netflix original that you really need to see. We have went with a classic horror movie from the 90s. Well, I use the term classic, maybe loosely. Cult horror film from the 90s, but not only first movie you're in for a treat we're going to talk about the whole box set all four movies john what are we talking about today today we are talking about wishmaster and indeed we'll talk about the 1997 film wishmaster directed by robert kurtzman and written by peter atkins beg for your life help me pray for your soul but whatever you do ready to play don't make a wish. Wish master. Careful what you wish for. Now, I don't know when you first heard this movie, John, but I first seen this in the video shop back in the day. And the cover caught my eye. It just looked like a 90s horror movie that you see in a VHS. But it said Wes Craven's name at the top. So that drew me towards it. I just expected to. Now, Wes Craven did produce the movie, but it is marketed as... Wes Craven presents Wishmaster, which is became quite a popular. It was quite a popular thing to do in the late nineties, early two thousands. Remember, yeah, like Quentin Tarantino presents Hostel and things like that. Yeah, when did you first see the Wishmaster? It was in maybe about ten years ago. I it completely passed me by when it was actually getting released. But it was one of these ones that I saw on a streaming service or something, or it was available, and or somebody was talking about it, and I had a quick look at it and thought. Four films. Oh, I don't know about that. It may be a wee bit, a wee bit much because there's usually a track record with these things. But that was kind of the first I'd <clears> heard <throat> of it. But I wasn't really drawn to it in any way at the time. I was, I think I was recommended it maybe about five, six months ago. And with the way that everything went in terms of cinema releases and lockdowns it was a perfect opportunity to sit and watch them and see what the mild fuss was about to be honest yeah it was kind of strange it might be fortuitous how this came about because i was tidying up at the beginning of the pandemic just because you're stuck in the house there's nothing more to do and i found the box set at the back of a cupboard and i was like i haven't seen this in ages and i remember messaging yourself about it but you were saying you were planning on watching it anyway yeah and i was like true. oh interesting and then we discussed maybe watching them doing a podcast on it. Kind of, I don't know, I think we were half joking at the time. And then the film popped up on Netflix. Spooky, almost, isn't it? It's it almost is. As if it was predetermined. As the plot of the movie will tell you, be careful what you wish for. Mm, very good. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you unfamiliar with the movie, it tells a story about an evil djinn a wish granting genie who is trapped in a jewel back in the day, back in, what was it? The... It was the 1100s, I think. 1100s, yeah. Yeah, some sultan unleashes them, tries to grant some wishes, uh, tries to ask for some wishes, but the djinn is very, very evil. He will grant your wish. There's a twist to it. It's not necessarily in your best favour, as people unfortunately find out. But a sorcerer trapped him in the jewel, and then decades later, in the then modern time, he is accidentally released from his prison by a uh, appraiser. Mm-hmm. She was a jewel appraiser called Alexandra, played by Tammy Lauren, who I have never seen in anything before or since. Same. But I actually, but I also think she's really good in this as well. I, I'm not going to have a go at her. I only mention her as being the lead because of the other actors in the movie that people may be more familiar with. So she accidentally unleashes the djinn, who is insistent that she grants him three wishes so he can be freed from his prison and unleash hell on the earth. And the tales of this, which I find really interesting, because <laughs> it's almost like the James Bond villain telling you his master plan. And yeah. yeah, and it said, he's like, here's my master plan, and I need you to help me with it. It doesn't try to trick her, it doesn't try to kind of corner, it just basically tells her straight up. <laughs> I find it very, very bizarre. The Wishmaster himself is played by Andrew Divoff, uh, who I think is absolutely brilliant in this movie. He is just so cheesily over the top. Do you agree? 
Oh, totally, yes. If you took his performance out of context, you would say that it's really wooden and quite stilted, but he's supposed to be like that because he's not of this earth. He's been around for thousands of years and he's got no interest in blending in with how people talk and what people do. So he is stilted and he is wooden. So he he comes across as being a very individual person, not like anybody else on earth at that time. So yeah, it does look a wee bit daft if you just look at just certain scenes of it. But when you see the whole film, you kind of get the reason why he did that. It's clever in a way. Yeah, I don't think anybody's actually ever described this movie as clever before, but (laughs) I'll take it. Yeah, I mean, this is a... This is very much a 90s horror movie, isn't it? Yes, yeah. Well, as you said at the start there, it's got Wes Craven's name all over it. And when you actually start the movie properly, it's got a very gory and effects-laden opening scene with the Persian emperor and him making a wish and all basically all hell breaking loose almost. There's all sorts of things going on there and it's all practical effects as well so it looks really good but it looks very 90s and it's the way that it was shot and everything but yeah it works it's a very good start to it and you think wow if this keeps up this is this is going to be quite something so yes you could you would need carbon dating technology to tell where this film <laughs> came from let's face it yeah everything from the kind of day, just to look at the movie to as you say the, the practical effects but that's what i like about this movie it does have a lot of practical effects and some of them are still still hold up really well mm-hmm. what doesn't is the albeit limited use of cgi they do use in the movie yes, again that's... it's very much an 80s movie yeah well the use of cgi is going to be a, a running theme through this discussion i think because there is some poor use in every movie but yes there is a certain amount of it within this movie but i don't think the the technology was really that developed that they could make full use of cgi in the way that they possibly wanted so they were falling back on the use of practical effects but they obviously had a, a great background in that anyway all the people that are working there i mean the director himself robert kurtzman he comes from a, an effects background does he not it does indeed yeah most famously for me most famous for nightmare on elm street 3 and you, you plenty of stuff since that, then there's that sort of the imagination and the implementation of the effects you can kind of trace back to that quite easily because it does look pretty much the same it's familiar but it's, it's still imaginative it's, it's very good use of practical effects really it's, it's just very good use of all their time i think it, it works well and it stands up it really st- like it stands up now when you're watching it so uh, you can't really complain about that in any way at all yeah it's interesting you mentioned the, like, the director or Kurtzman and i think that's maybe his first movie <clears throat> they directed but as you say he was known for special effects mostly he worked in films like Nightmare on Elm Street Tremors as well he worked on that if you look at his credits actually as some um, uh, quite iconic creature feature movies he's been involved in and it was written by Peter Atkins who was most famously known for the Hellraiser sequels special Hellraiser 2 which is a very good movie yes as we have already discussed yes indeed yes please look it up in the podcast archives where we talk about just how good Hellraiser 2 actually is. Yes, uh, it had a very good pedigree, I, I thought. And it was interesting for the fact that it was a very strong female lead as mm-hmm. well, which in well 90s horror films weren't exactly known for having that many strong female leads. There were some out there, obviously, but usually they were reduced to supporting roles and the screaming roles and the damsel in distress or the woman who goes bad or something like that. So it was good to see the fact that the main character was uh, an intelligent and thoughtful person who basically used her intelligence in a way to try and overcome the djinn because, as you say, he told her straight up, going to do so. It was up to her to try and do something about it. And while everybody else around her seemed to be sort of standard horror characters and they met their grisly ends or whatever, or they, they... reacted in the way that they did she didn't she was a a fairly unique character and like you say it was a really good performance but it was a really good performance because it was a really good character to begin with she had a lot to work with there which is again unusual not so much i mean Wes craven has been known for making female characters fairly strong and all that but for the time there was an awful lot of films out there that just didn't have 
anything like that at all. There's obviously the elements that she doesn't scare easily, which is obviously something because you don't get you don't get her screaming all the time, and she works very well under pressure. So therefore, it makes the story more interesting, and you're actually drawn into it a little more than you you, you would be if it was a, a lesser character. It's quite it was it was, a, it was an interesting touch. I thought. What did you think? Yeah, def- definitely, I agree with hundred percent. She's not your typical final girl so to speak, mm-hmm. and unlike other movies where, I mean, it does still follow that kind of horror template where you've got, she's the main focus, you know she is going to be, still going to be the final girl, so to speak. She's the person that has been targeted. If you've got Halloween, for example, you get Jim Lee Curtis, you get Nancy by Hera Langkamp and Freddy Krueger, you always have that connection, and here you've got the gin, and you've got Alexandra. You're right, she's not someone who's like, from right off the bat, she knows about the gin, mm. and she spends the rest of the movie not just running from him and trying to escape or hide, but as you say, trying to find a way to defeat him. Because she's dealing with this creature who's got godlike power. How do you fight that? You can't, really. But she does also have the upper hand that how does she use her wishes, for example? How does she be clever in defeating yes. him? Yeah, there's obviously the gin takes great delight in granting the wishes because he grants the wishes literally. So if someone asks for something, they get what they want, but they may not be exactly what it's, you know, if, if someone says, oh, you know, make the stop, he usually kills them because then it makes, he says, well, I made it stop. <laughs> yeah. That was my interpretation of the, the gin's voice. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, really weird <clears throat> cadence to his, his vocals and everything. So he, he speaks unlike everybody else. He speaks like someone from a previous century. It's not, he's, again, he doesn't try and blend in, but it's, it's quite funny the way that he does that and then that obviously opens everything up for quite gory interludes if you like because these things these things that happen to people they're not going to be nice you know nobody asks for a puppy you know no obviously end up with puppy and fire or something you know you know (laughs) and for the most part he's he's preying on people's greed as well and it's that kind of way some some of the deaths in this are absolutely grotesque and quite horrifying but this is supposed to be a fun movie and it isn't without its humor yeah there's there's a fair element of that yes i mean just for example it's like it's not going to many spoilers but the guy wishes for a million dollars and he grants his wish and the reason he gets a million dollars is because an insurance clause his mum signs and, and then she's not she's not plane explosion. <laughs> <laughs> and you see you put that on paper, you're going, Why is that why is that funny? And you see how it plays out in the scene. It's supposed to be comic. It's a mm-hmm. comic effect. And the, the gin himself, uh, played the off, he's like a mixture of a pinhead meets Freddy Krueger, I kinda of felt. Mm-hmm. And he's got some cracking one liners and he's very charming and he's He's a, he's a fun villain. Yes, he enjoys himself. He he takes his time about getting his ends. You know, he's looking for the three wishes to be granted. But if he has fun along the way, yeah. am, amusing himself because basically he's been stuck in a duel for something like ten centuries or nine centuries. So he's up for a bit of fun for a while. He's he's going to enjoy himself. And you're you're right. It doesn't take itself totally seriously but it, it does have its gory elements which make it a little more serious than just a, a straight up comedy you know yeah I mean, it's definitely not a straight up comedy it's, it's not it, it invites you to laugh with it at certain parts it's not a comical movie by any means and like i said some of the deaths in that and it are pretty gruesome and it is pretty violent but it knows how to balance it it knows when it's to be a fun death so to speak yes. and then it also knows when it's not here you're supposed to be scared here's you're supposed to be horrified here's a grotesque aspect of it and there's a scene with jenny o'hara who plays wendy and she's like a expert on gins and stuff um, and alexander goes to speak to her I don't want to say too much more because it is a bit spoilery but it's a great scene mm. and i can mention this without being too without being a spoiler it's also clever how the gin will get people to grant wishes and there's a scene in particular when he's in the police office, he's been in the police station, and the cop goes, him, do you know what I wish? And he goes, I'd love to know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, such, it's such an over-the-top, enthusiastic way he delivers a line. He's almost as well turning to the camera and winking. Yeah, that's what it's like. 
it's so so much fun. I had so much. I've seen I've seen this movie loads of times, and I had such a great time watching it again. And when, when I discovered it, another thing about the movie, and it's got some amount of cameos. I noticed that yes, there's quite a number of them, which some of them I didn't get when I saw the film. But obviously, looking back on it, there's some really really good ones. Obviously, the the main ones, Robert England, who plays a. a a reasonable, it's, it's more than just a cameo role, I would say, for him. It's more yeah, of a he's got, supporting role. He's got a very prominent role in it as the antiques dealer. Yeah, and of course, you've got Tony Todd, who is only in it for well, it's a very short time. He's in it, really, isn't it? But yeah, there's yeah. a whole host of people who are in there as well. It's just it's quite bizarre <laughs> having read up on it. It's, it's crazy. I, I really didn't know that Vern Troyer, who was in Austin Powers, he was mini me in Austin Powers, he was the the small gen in it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you know, obviously I would never recognise him because of the makeup and the prosthetics and everything that he was wearing. But I yeah, it's just I think a, a lot of that was probably the, the Wes Craven connection as well and the horror connections. They were bringing some of these people in to basically give the film a bit of a leg up in its initial release. Exactly. It wouldn't, wouldn't do any harm really, you know. Yeah, it didn't do any harm to see Robert England, uh, Tony Todd, and Kane Hodder on the credits. Kane Hodder obviously played Jason Voorhees in Friday the 13th, Part 7, to Jason X. He plays the security guard in the movie. And it's interesting, you've got Robert England, you've got Freddy Krueger and Jason in this movie before Freddy vs. Jason. Obviously, Kane Hodder didn't play the part in that movie. It's, it's another story. But you've also got Joseph Palato, who was famous for being David Ed. Of a very, A very important role. And did you know, did you clock who the narrator was at the beginning of the movie? No, I did not. Who was that? It was Angus Scrim, who is known for playing the tall man in Phantasm. Right, right, of course, yeah. I, I recognised the voice, but I couldn't quite place it at the yeah. time. But yeah, that's, it's, it's impressive the number of people they got in. It really is. And it adds to it, it just adds to the sort of whole load of the film itself. And it makes it interesting and it makes it so that you're once you find these things out, you want to go back and watch it again just to try and catch some of these wee cameos and everything because it's, it's a fun, it's a fun element to it. Something that's unexpected in a horror film, especially something that's sort of a mid-budget horror film because they're usually just trying to get it done and get it out there. So there's been awful, obviously been an awful lot of thought and a few favors called in in order to get people to do that, and they were obviously quite happy to do it given the fact it was Kurtzman and it was Wes Craven who was running the show here. So very, yeah. very good. Something that I thought was excellent, and it was the score. It was an excellent score. It was one of these sweeping, dramatic scores that made the film seem as if it was <laughs> it was a bigger budget film than it actually was. Because it was, it was, I mean, it was about five million or something that cost to make it. But yeah. because of that, it felt very dramatic, and it really drove the story and elements and all that. And you're thinking, yes, yeah, not very. It was very well thought out. The whole thing was very well thought out. It wasn't the, the best script in the world or anything, but it was thought out and it was delivered really well. So I couldn't complain about it whatsoever and I really enjoyed the film. Yeah, I mean, and speaking of the, the score there, Harry Manfredini on the score, who is most famous for Friday the 13th. So again, some more horror, horror royalty involved in this movie. And I just don't think this film goes enough love, <laughs> basically, hence all a podcast on it. But you've got like... Hellraiser, I love that. Hell, the writer from Hellraiser, obviously, Andrew Kurtzman wasn't known for being like the director and creative force behind the Nightmare on Street and that, but he's got that experience from being involved in those movies. He's learning from Wes Craven yes. instead of directing. And you've got all these cameos from a uh, horror royalty come together in this movie. And yeah, it just, it's just a, it's a nice little collection of who's who in horror, I, I think. Oh, yeah, it works. It works very well. It works a lot better than its rating of 26% approval on Rotten Tomatoes. It definitely does. That's a little low as far as I think. It's pretty harsh, isn't it? It is. It's a bit. Well, you know what it's like. Horror films tend to get panned more than other genres, I would say. Well, maybe not comedies, but yeah, they, they tend to get a bit more of a beating. There's yeah. less work for them out there. It's more niche. Yeah, it's very much a movie that kind of knows its influences, wears its heart on its sleeve, and it's very unapologetic in what it is. Absolutely. And because of that, it works. It's set expectations and it meets them. It doesn't try to overshoot them in any way. It's a small, medium-budget horror film, and it works, and it's fun. 
So you, you can't really get much better than that, let's face it, especially for a 90s horror film. There was, there was an awful lot worse out there at the time. Oh, definitely. So I think I really answered this one, John, but I take it this is going to be a recommended for yourself. Yes, definitely. Yeah, I would recommend this film to anybody if they came and said, what would you, you know, if they were going to recommend horror films, then yes, I would definitely recommend this one for anybody to watch. Exactly. Well, as we said, people, it's on Netflix, so you could do worse than a Friday, Saturday night, then get a few beers, get the pizza in, fire up Netflix, watch Wishmaster and just have some fun with a good old 90s horror movie that just doesn't give a fuck. Now, the movie did make a decent return on its investment. However, the so they get a sequel, but the sequel went straight to D I think it went straight to DVD. I think it was a made for TV movie, if I recall. Prepare yourself for the next level of terror. Make your wishes. Wishmaster 2, evil never dies. It's over. Jack Shoulder wrote and directed it. Jack Shoulder, uh, most famously known for Nightmare on Elm Street 2, a movie that you could do an entire podcast or podcast on in itself due to its themes, whether intentional or not. But so you've got a sequel, and this time the evil Jin, again played by Andrew Devoff, is awakened by a female thief, Morgana. What a name, Morgana. I know. In a movie like this. <laughs> She accidentally awakens him during a botched strawberry. He then decides to take credit for the crime, letting himself be put into prison. Worth there, he can then prey on the prisoners and grant them their wishes, feed on their souls, get powerful, blah, 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 blah. You know the plot by now. <laughs> it wants to... Here's a thing about the Fish Master film that never really explains, so... Which I don't mind because it's like a horror and you can kind of allow some certain things. He's awakened by the, the person who awakes him. He gives him three wishes... And when those three wishes are granted, he gets to roam the earth and do what he wants. In between that, he can just grant wishes while they're not people. <laughs> and I get why it's in the script, because I kind of can't say, well, if you can only grant three wishes, there's not going to be much of a body count. Exactly, yes. There's a few, especially in this film, people who who would give him the, the three wishes right away. Well, there's an old drunk, for instance, near the start. If he said, what do you wish for? And the guy told him, he would say, right, what else? And he would tell him that as well. He would do the three wishes quite often. The film would be over in about 10 minutes. So yes, yeah, there is a, there's there's logic that you can probably drive a bus through. But yeah, let, let's not dwell on that. No, not at all. It, it kind of it detracts a wee bit from the film when you when you start poking holes in these things. And let's face it, with some of these discussions on sequels, then you, you've got more things that you can point out before you point at some of the, the the logical elements that are missing from them. But I don't mind that. I don't. I don't mind it. I've always said this. See if there's something illogical in a movie or a big gaping plot hole. If it's entertaining enough, I won't care. And I think with the first Bush Master, that was a kind of case. You go, what about this? That? Who cares? It doesn't matter because it makes sense in terms of the script. It has to get things going. And the kind of movie it is, if you're looking for plot holes and stuff, just maybe go and watch something else. Wishmaster 2, on the other hand, I I don't think this is a good film, but I do enjoy it. Yeah. I, I do quite enjoy it. It's not as good as the first one. I did enjoy the second film, but I wholly agree with you. It's not a good film. No. The way that it starts off... You think, oh well, this could—it's a bit of more of the same. But then suddenly, they, they, there's talk of the prophecy. You're going, whoa, 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 what, what, what prophecy? What are you talking about? What's, what's going on here? The way that you introduced the second film there by saying he goes to prison, that was a very, very good idea in the part yeah. of the filmmakers by doing that because it, it was very entertaining the way they did it. But there was a reason behind doing that because of the prophecy. The prophecy states that in order to get up to power, he has to have a thousand souls. So he thinks, well, I'll go to prison and I'll get them there. But this was never mentioned in the first film. It was all just the, you know, grant me three wishes kind of idea. There wasn't anything to do with that. I think it's got something to do with building up his power so that he can actually enjoy himself when, <laughs> when it's hell on earth. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what it is, but the way that it was done worked. But yeah, the the logic behind that was kind of all over the place. You're kind of going, wait, so you're you're changing the whole backstory of this character and what he actually does and what he stands for. None of this was mentioned. They didn't even hint at this in the first film, but 
it's right up to the four. They did. They did mention the fact that, like, if the if the three wishes are granted, that all oh, the other gins would come through as well. Yeah, yeah. They just they didn't mention the the thousand the thousand soul power up that you need. You know, nothing like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, to, to, and also to be fair, um, I think he told Alexandra enough of his master plan. Mm, Maybe kind of caught himself. <laughs> <laughs> Because if he was here, I said, oh, by the way, I need to get a thousand souls first as well. And she went, okay, then good luck. See you after. Come back to, come back to me in a few hours. So because of that, there was plenty of opportunity for gore and madness and death and blood and guts and everything. And uh, I think they, they did that pretty well. They, there was some inventive use of granting of wishes and people getting the just desserts by really asking for what they wanted, like the, the guy in prison who wanted his lawyer to go fuck himself. And I thought oh, yeah. that was a, a particularly inventive way without actually really showing you anything. But that was that was clever. And I, I liked the, the wee twist on that because when he went in to see his lawyer, his lawyer was like, yeah, I've got enough evidence. You know, you are out of here today. And then he starts going, oh, oh, oh. The guy's going, oh, no, no, what have I done? You know? So that was, a, you know, the, the humour from the first film carried over into that as well. And that, that kind of worked very nicely. In terms of the story itself and the, the main characters and everything, it wasn't quite as strong. Again, it was a, a strong female character who yeah. initially lets them out. What we found here though was that she tended to wear skimpy outfits. There was scenes of her like thrashing about the bed and she was just wearing like whatever, you know, not not very many clothes and you're kind of going, hmm, okay, why are they doing this? And then you realise it's kind of just to use up a wee bit more wee bit of time and they're they're trying to appeal to a certain audience by doing this. And that a lot of that was kind of prevalent in horror and thriller films of the time. There was some elements that you, you probably wouldn't get now. People would question it more now. And viewing it from sort of a, a 2020 perspective, you can kind of go, nah, there's no need for that. You know, wh- why are they doing that? It's just a male gaze thing that they're, they're, they're doing just in order to almost de- demean this character. But... In this case, it's the, the main character that you're demeaning, this Morgana character, who she's conflicted, obviously, because at the start of the film, she is involved in this robbery and it goes badly. She obviously escapes, like you say, but she, well, it's not very much of a spoiler because it happens the first couple of minutes. Yeah. She kills a security guard. And because of that, she is seen to be like unclean and unholy because when she's trying to figure out how to outfox the djinn, she realises that she can't do it because she's not pure of heart or anything like that. And that was quite a, a, an unsatisfying way to, to go, I thought. It didn't sort of give the character many options. And then when they found a way around it, that was completely unsatisfying and it didn't work very well either. I mean, I know I'm trying not to, I'm trying to skip around things. Basically, what the way I can put it is she redeemed herself in one way and then she didn't redeem herself at all because basically she had sex with a priest. Now, that doesn't make you a pure person. <laughs> so that didn't really work particularly well for me. I thought that's not that's not something you would normally do in order to try and get onto a righteous path. Yeah, it just kind of felt like a case of like, right, let's just put a sex scene in to try and spice things up. Uh, yeah. Something that was very, all, all the kind of things were missing for the first movie. Mm. They didn't do that to the, the lead actress, the lead character. Yes. They kind of managed to avoid that, as you said, just make this really kind of strong, tough, taking no shit film type of, type of heroine. There's not in the way of many cameos in this movie. The, we don't have like well-known movie villains turning back up, but it is noticeable for Tom Tiny Lister playing one of the guards. I know this guy. He played a professional wrestler in the film No Holes Barred, starring Hulk Hogan. He played Zeus. They then turned it into a real-life, so to speak, storyline in the wrestling, where he came in as a professional wrestler. But he's also, also in my opinion, quite well-known for being the prisoner in The Dark Knight, who throws the remote over the boat. Yeah. If you old his IMDb, for example, you would see a lot of movies he's in that you recognise him from. But yeah, I totally forgot he was in this. And no offence to him, but there's no there's nobody really else recognisable that will make you go, oh, that's such and such compared to the first movie. I mean you've got like who's who of horror royalty. I thought the prison stuff was great. It was a lot of fun. I felt the stuff outside the prison, the wheels fell off a little. 
I did enjoy the stuff with the Russian gangsters and the casino scene is great, especially yeah. for a TV movie. Yeah, that, that does work particularly well. It's quite a, a well done conclusion. It ties things up nicely in that it allows them to start collecting a number of souls. That's one of the problems he has. He's got a limited number of souls he can actually collect while he's in prison. So by getting out and then getting getting this casino element, then you've got hundreds of willing participants there. It, it, that does work well. And again, that throws back a little to the very opening scene of the first film in that there's a lot of practical effects in there. And they work particularly well. There's a, a roulette wheel which turns into this almost like a scythe it rolls about on the floor and people are getting chopped up and all sorts of things and that that mm. works really well and it looks good do you know, uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You do you know uh, andrew devoff never splinked in any scenes that kind of makes sense it's that intensity about the yeah. performance from him i mean you could, I, I i'm surprised this guy hasn't done more he's he's, 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 a, he's a working actor he's had loads of things since, but I mean, in terms of like uh, your Robert Englund, for example, who you'll recognize him in other roles and go, Oh, he was in House of a Thousand Maniacs, or was it House of, was it House of Ten Thousand Maniacs? Ten, I can't remember these films, all similar titles. <laughs> Ten Thousand Maniacs, I think it was. The mayor, it was, it was the mayor of Pleasant Valley. You ever seen that? No, no, I've never seen that. I would remember. Oh, it's seen. mental. Oh, it's nuts. It's nuts. Uh, it's a couple of people that you'd recognize. It's, 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 it's a fun movie, but uh, Town for like Cannibals. Oh, nice. Yes, mental. Um, but I digress. Yeah, but I just thought Andrew Devolf was so good in this. It's a shame that he didn't really do much else in terms of recognisable roles after that. Yes, he was He was consistent in both the films and he was a, a very good antagonist. In them. He, his performance was pretty much the same across the two. And that's not a criticism. He had a, a level of intensity, which I didn't realise. He didn't blink, but obviously that adds to it. And he was a, a very good bad guy, a very good villain. And you enjoy his performance, enjoy his time in screen because you know you're going to get some sort of payback from it. It's always interesting to see how these guys actually approach these roles. But he's obviously set himself up quite early and stuck to that, not changed yeah. it across the two. And and that's good because there's this, obviously there's a continuity line between the two films with the, the statue that he was hidden in and the first one with the jewel was hidden in. And then the, that's actually referenced during the robbery in the second film and all that. So, so yeah, there's a, a lot of continuity there. And because of that, it strengthens his performance as he's going on. And yeah, he, he's, he has a great time. And as you can tell, that he really enjoyed that role. Yeah. Do you recommend that? I would, just for the the fun factor and the, the fact that it is a fairly decent follow-up to Wishmaster and there's a, a through line to it, it's good to see both films. There is a drop-off in quality, no doubt about that. The production values aren't quite as high, different people involved in it. But yes, I, I would say, yeah, give it a watch just for completeness. Not, not only just for completeness, but yeah, definitely if you've watched the first one, Give this one a watch as well. You won't be disappointed. You? I 100% agree yeah. with that. So it means it's, it's, it's not the greatest horror sequel of all time. Like I say, I don't even think it's necessarily like a good movie, but it's fun. And I've seen the first one. There's no harm in watching this. I don't think it's on Netflix, unfortunately. But yeah, if you get a chance to see it, see it. And that takes us on to Wishmaster 3. The only thing greater than his power. Three wishes. Otherwise, the cells closest to her will perish. This can bind me. Is the evil behind it? You strike me as a man who could break a girl's heart. Do you wish me to break your heart, young lady? Oh, yes, please. Which, unfortunately, also, um, we don't have Andrew Devoff returning as the djinn. And the reason being that they took so long getting the script together that they eventually gave him it. He just didn't like it. <laughs> he didn't like the original draft. And he wasn't a fan. He went, nah, I'm not coming back. Which is fair enough to him. I mean, that's a guy with some principle as well. As opposed to just say, yeah, I'll just do it. That's what I'm known for. He's like, nah, I'm not, I'm not feeling it. And he was right in my opinion. Although I do think he would have made that a better movie also. So it's a two double edged sword in that one. Yes, yeah, I can understand why he didn't come back in terms of the role, but uh, he was sorely missed. He definitely was. The film was nowhere near in terms of the production values or the, the writing that the first two were. And the first two, the second one wasn't particularly high, but this there was a noticeable drop 
in this film. Yeah. It basically changed the genre with this film as well. It, before you were talking about horror fantasy, this one changed it so it was more emphasis on action rather yeah. than horror, I thought. It, that's never a good thing when you kind of change midstream. I thought that the, well, have we talked about the story itself? I haven't even mentioned Not that. yet, no. I just oh, made a wee connection, no. Uh, Andrew Devoff actually did reprise his role. He wrote a draft for this, and the producers didn't go with it. They went with the other writer, and he hated the other script. So, so he's still, he still left for the, different, the same reason, but I didn't realise he'd actually written a draft first. That'd be interesting. I'd like to see what that was like. It would be, yes. It would be interesting to see what he'd actually come up with for moving that, that character forward, because, let's face it, by the second and third film... In any series, it's usually focusing on the main antagonist, especially like horror franchises. It's it's moving away from the, the likes of the Jamie Lee Curtis character in Halloween and moving yeah. more towards the Michael Myers. Obviously not. In the, uh, Halloween was probably a bad example because Halloween 3 was a completely different film to the uh, first two films, but that's uh, a digression. So what was the plot of the, the, the plot for what it was of this third film? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is from IMDb, I'm taking this one, but the evil gen is back at it again. This time we can have it on the students of Illinois Baxter University. And right off the bat, you're like, okay, this has just got horror cliche 101 written here. He's going to start targeting co-eds at uni. And this time he is accidentally released from his prison because nobody ever wants to wake this guy up on purpose by Diana Collins, a student at the university. Of course, when the gen played by AJ Cook, when the gen is released this time, he's obviously not played by Andrew Devoff, who we've mentioned is gone, but instead by John Novak, in creature form at least anyway, because not long after being released, he grants a wish to a college professor by the name of Professor Joe Barash, who's played by Jason Connery. You know what happens when he grants wishes, it never ends well, blah, 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 he kills him, but it takes his identity for the majority of the movie. So for most of the movie, you've got Jason Connery playing the gin. And I don't think he's that bad. Mm, that's kind of debatable. I thought he was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was, he was really wooden. He's a, he's a decent actor. I've seen him in a few things. But the script here didn't lend him any sort of leeway to do anything with it at all. It was a, a very poorly sort of sketched out character. Like you say, it was like a co-ed slasher type movie and for the fact that it was on screen for quite a lot of time he didn't have an awful lot to play with no in terms of his character it was very one note it really was didn't didn't seem to work very well at all unfortunately they missed that kind of intensity that andrew Diboff brought in the first two films it just wasn't the same type of character it should have been but it, it was just nowhere near the same which was a real shame. Yeah, it was a fair point, actually. I mean, it's like it's all very well, like an actor bringing his personality to the role and trying to do something different. This is a different character completely. It feels like this doesn't seem like the same gin from the previous movies in any way. Even when John Novak's playing them in Creature Makeup, it does so with a lot more seriousness and a lot more. This is a movie that doesn't laugh at itself in the same way. I don't know so much itself, it doesn't take itself, it takes itself a lot more seriously. In the previous two, and you kind of wonder why it's decided to go down this route. Three movies in, a fraction of the budget made for TV, they now decide to try and do a serious movie. Yeah, it doesn't work in that respect whatsoever. I thought the when he was on screen as the gin, it, it didn't work. The the effects, the rubber that he'd obviously been poured into, just it didn't look anywhere near as powerful it, it looked as if it was like sort of sweaty plastic he was under for most of it which wasn't really a good look and the character was it, it, it altered it wasn't the same in any way if you that first scene that you talked about where the professor is granted a wish the, the wish he's granted is he wants to be loved by a beautiful woman so these two beautiful women come in and start getting to it with them now the gin is standing there watching and his hands are all moving about and all that. And he's got a strange look in his face. And you're like, what, what is he doing here? What's it? You know, it's, it's almost as if he's orchestrating this thing. You know, oh, oh, and all this sort of stuff. And that kind of puts you off right from the start. It's just, you know, it, it was just absolute nonsense. Again, with this film, it completely changes the mythology. 
because mm -hmm. this time the fire ruby is in a box. There was no mention of any box before, you know, before it was, it was hidden inside a statue. So where did the box come from that had been hidden in and obviously there was some sort of secret combination to get into it? That didn't make any sense. So you were going, what's going on here? This has been delivered from somewhere. It was a museum piece or something. So that kind of jars you. And then, like you say, it's, it turned into this sort of soft core romp in places as well. There was, yeah. you know, like the sex scenes and topless women for apparently no reason whatsoever. It, it was obviously done just to get a certain audience in again. It went that stage beyond the second film. It just decided, right, this is what we're going to do. It was, but it was totally unnecessary, I thought. For a film that was only 90 minutes long, it felt like a long film, unfortunately. I yeah. didn't get the same pleasure I got from the first two, which is a real shame, you know? Yeah. And then, I mean, how many horror films like this can you say there was a car chase in it? <laughs> <laughs> I just, uh, I couldn't believe it. And that, again, that was done because, that showed its production values because that was done really, really badly, that car chase, because the professor's chasing him. He gets on top of the car and he's hanging on and trying to sort of get them, get the two people who are in the car. And I don't know why I noticed this, but it was really prominent. At one point, he nearly falls off the car, so he's dangling at the side. And you get a close-up of his shoes. That's the shoes that the stuntman's wearing. It's not the shoes that the character's wearing. <laughs> when he falls off the car, he's wearing completely different shoes. He's wearing like rubber soled ones when he's dangling off the car, and then he's got his leather soled ones. And it's a close-up both times because when he comes off the car, he, his legs get broken, if you remember, mm. and they're sort of splayed all over. And he's, he's, his shoes are right at the front. And I'm thinking, I shouldn't be concentrating on yeah. his in this film there's something seriously wrong when you're doing that and it, it drags you kicking and screaming out of any sort of enjoyment that you had of it when you're you're thinking about that sort of thing and it just nah. yeah the thing as well is this, this this feels like two different movies so for me the went right we're gonna we're gonna take what made the first two movies enjoyable remove that try and go for a more serious horror movie that's totally deadpan with a straight face then halfway through, change into, as you mentioned, some kind of fantasy action movie where, this isn't much of a spoiler, but Diana makes a wish to summon the Archangel Michael to fight the djinn. <laughs> and his sword. <laughs> and his sword, yeah. So, and I'm just like, okay, if I was watching an episode of Buffy, maybe Angel, I'd be quite into this. But where did this come from? Exactly, yes. It was, that was a real... And it, of course... He's a very good looking archangel, you know, and he comes in and he says, Ah, oh, we we meet again, Wishmaster, and all this. <laughs> and, then, and, then <laughs> a, and then it's a really rubbish fight. You would think if they've met so many times, you'd have an idea how to fight them. But then he just hits them over the head with a pew because they're in the church and you go, Come on, come on, Archangel Michael, get it together here, you know. But yeah, you're totally right. You're just the idea that the thought was, it gives you the idea that they fought throughout history. Some kind yeah. of like uh, ancient enemies locked in some kind of eternal battle. They just didn't think to mention it until the third movie. Yeah. Halfway through <laughs> that. There was no, there's no way I seen the first movie. Was, I saw, I'm glad to put the duel in three of that Archangel Michael. And let's be honest, it is over the top as the first movie was. It took something quite impressive to pull that off. And they don't do it here. And which is unforgivable for me is the entire third act is during the day. Yes. Totally takes away from it, doesn't it? It just doesn't it, work at any point. It looks, it looks like an episode of like. It's like a bad police procedural. It's, yeah, it's like CSI or something. Yes, it doesn't even have production values of CSI. It's something. No, that's what I was trying to think of something else. That, yes, yeah, it's it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's like murder she wrote or something. If, if you can imagine a car chase and murder she wrote, that's what it would be I, like. Actually, that is what it's like, and that's nothing against Murder She Wrote. It's a great program for its time, but it's very, very dated. And this is a movie that was made like twenty years after Murder She Wrote, and feels like an episode of it. And I have nothing against a horror movie being set during the day, but it has to be a very good horror movie to pull it off. Like Candyman, for example. Yeah. That's a movie that shouldn't work set during the daytime. And the fact that it is makes it even more terrifying. This doesn't work. But at this point, it's not even a horror movie. They've, they've changed their mind what kind of movie this is. So I'm not trying to try to scare you anymore. I don't know yeah. what they're trying to do. Yeah, I think they kind of got lost about halfway through and then thought, how are we going to wrap this up? So 
they just did it as quickly and as cheaply as possible, which obviously involved daytime, everything to do with that. And it was a completely unsatisfying ending as well. I thought. It was terrible. Oh, it was really, really, really bad. It just ends. Yeah. It's the film. I, I wouldn't like to spoil it for anybody, but it's a terrible ending. <laughs> <laughs> you ever seen the Simpsons episode with uh, Pucci? Mm-hmm. Yes. The Homer Queen Pucci. And the writer about the show by saying, I have to go now. My home planet needs me. Yes. <laughs> That's the end of this movie. <laughs> oh man, it was just awful. It was really bad. So I take it that we're in agreement here. Would you recommend this film? Unless you have bought the Wishmaster box set, I can yes. see no reason to watch this. Yeah, even then you would probably use this, this one as a coaster for your tea while you watch the first two films. It's a, it's a <laughs> very bad movie. <laughs> I like that. <sighs> well... That was Wishmaster 3, and if you think things are going to get better with Wishmaster 4, you, <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're unfortunately mistaken. There are legends we can't believe. Who are you? I can grant you anything you desire. <laughs> Evils we can't imagine. What happened to you last night? You might say I was reborn. And wishes we should never make. What do you wish for? To be the kind of man that you want me to be. <laughs> Wishmaster 4. Oh, God. It was a plot. Let's move again. I can't remember. Let's find out. I gave this one a watch this afternoon just before we come on, so it is relatively fresh. A young couple move into a new house. They christen the house by having sex almost right away. And then it cuts to three years later and the guy's in a wheelchair. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the wife is trying to get compensation for the husband because he was in a motorcycle accident, which they say was not his fault. So she has a lawyer on hand. And this lawyer is obviously a very sleazy guy and he's obviously eh, trying to get into her pants. So he gives her a gift, which is a box. It's not the same box in three, but it's a box and it falls to the floor and guess what falls out of it? Fire Ruby. Woman picks it up. (laughs) And there we go. It goes from there. The gin itself appears to the lawyer, grants him a wish, kills him, takes his face, which I've never understood. He does that a few times. He's able to shapeshift however he wants, but he takes a, he takes the lawyer's face and becomes him in order for the three wishes to be granted again. This time it's sort of the, the final the final go around almost. It's really to unleash the rest of the gin into the the world. Now the twist in this film, and I'm, I'm going to spoil this a little bit. The lawyer is obviously very sleazy to begin with. He's obviously even sleazier as the wishmaster. He gets her to ask for her three wishes round about the 45 minute mark in the film. Now, I thought that was going, this can't yeah. be right now. There's another whole half of the film. And basically, the final wish, he says, oh, th- this is a bit of a conundrum. Only you, as in the girl, can grant this wish, which is a crock of shite. He can do whatever he wants. He's the wish master. Basically, he's fallen in love with her and he doesn't want things to change, which is a real departure in terms of the Wishmaster franchise, because before it was all about him being this playful character who liked to fool people into making wishes and he would take a great pleasure from granting them and almost absorbing the the nastiness and the the gore that came from it and then obviously going after the the woman for the three wishes and uh, i will i will end everything for you but i'll give you everything what you want in between this is a total change because he's kind of like right guys yeah 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 she, she's done what she said she was going to do but you know i think there's a wee clause in here and everybody's going no 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 <laughs> what are you talking about just could just grant the wish you're the wish master and he's going no 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 and it's purely because that he's fallen in love with her which is not something you would expect really no, and it just, again, totally takes you straight out of the movie. Even in the context of this movie, let's just pretend there's never, there's never been any Wishmaster movies. And you're just watching this as a standalone thing. It still seems a bit weird because it all happens so fast. Yes. And I can buy Jason Thompson's Sam as falling in love with her because he's a human and he's quite a handsome guy. But when it cuts to your full caution, that Wishmaster, it just... You're not buying it at all, and not at all. And 
Jason Thompson, actually, who played the, the lawyer, he won a daytime Emmy this year oh, for? for The Young and the Restless. Ah, right, okay. And he'd been nominated five times for Outstanding Lead Actor in a Drama Series for General Hospital. Interesting. So I mean, he he is, it's fairly decent. I mean, he's a decent actor. He came across better than The Wishmaster in the third film, <laughs> the human in- incarnation of The Wishmaster. So, because he didn't, he was he was closer to the first one than he was to The Wishmaster. Yeah. It was, there's a certain stillness about that, that character in the first, second and fourth film. They don't express themselves an awful lot, so that works because it's creepier when you're not doing something than it is when you're going nuts and getting involved in car chases and all sorts of stuff and basically telegraphing everything that you're going to do by saying, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to put a stick through your heart, whatever. And they don't do that. So it was a better character, but it was just, oh, it was... I mean, if you, if you thought the budget for the third film was low, this one was even lower. It just, oh, man... Yeah, well, these films were directed back to back by Chris Angel, not the to be confused with the famous magician Chris Angel, <laughs> which would be interesting. Uh, but yeah, these films are filmed back to back. I think mean, it was a, a weekend between shooting, and as you say, it really shows. It really does show. I do think this film is marginally better than the previous one, just because it does try something a little different that works in the sense that yeah, the wishes get granted quite early on, so. Mm-hmm. The thing that the gin has been longing for for three movies now in the fourth one, it does mix up a little. But then you've got the the character of the boyfriend who's in a wheelchair for part of the film. Obviously, one of the wishes that get granted is going to be so he can walk again. But even then, he mopes about for the whole film. You know, I, <clears throat> basically. He moped about at the start because his wife was ignoring him and she, he thought that she was having an affair. And then when that did, and he thought he wasn't a man enough because he was sitting in the wheelchair all the time. So he, he had nothing to give her. But then when he gets his, the power of his legs back, he's still moping about and you're going, oh, for fuck's sake, man, you know, get it together, you know? What's going he's on such, here? He's such a damn squibber character to the point you're actually written. For the Wishmaster. <laughs> yeah, when, when uh, the, the third act comes around and certain things happen, you kind of go, yeah, I'm kind of glad that happened. That's, that's that's probably a good thing. It's so... Oh, I think It's not a good movie. Oh, no, it's, 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 <laughs> it's worse than not a good movie. It's, like you say, it's better than the third one, but it's not that much better than the third one, to be honest. It's sad. Uh... Here's the thing is here's the thing as well about it, and uh, again, if this is kind of spoilery, I don't think you'll care by this point because uh, if you really want to see Wishmaster four and three, for that matter, let it be on your head. <laughs> they kind of tie in some, or you think they tie in some from the previous movie where an angel appears and it wants to kill Lisa to prevent the third wish from being granted to her, yeah. and you think to yourself, "What's this time back into the last one? Is Michael coming back?" But it's not. It's another random angel who's never been mentioned before. Yeah, this is the the angel who is basically there to stop the Wishmaster, but or stop in this case, he's because she is still alive after she's she hasn't quite granted or, or three wishes haven't been granted. He comes in to to kill her, and again, it's it's this it's another underwear model that comes in wielding a big sword, and or well, he's he's awful as well. Again. He's supposed to be this warrior, this warrior angel, and he's really bad at sword fighting <laughs> again. <laughs> and it is comical to see him against the gin because the gin obviously is in full rubber makeup at this point. So it's an underwater, <laughs> it's an underwear model versus a man in a big rubber suit. And it's it's comical to actually watch it. And like I, I said, it just dropped in there, just totally dropped in. And it's only dropped in because the gin is having a conversation with all his pals who are still in hell in a, a badly CG'd fire pit that opens up at the front door. And they say, you know, this bloke's been released. And everybody in the audience must have gone, what bloke? <laughs> he says yeah. that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ah, well, don't worry. I will kill him. And it's... It's where's this guy been for the last four movies? Yes, exactly, yeah. And they never mentioned any clauses at the end of the, you know, no. there wasn't any of this... You know, you get your three wishes granted, but oh, by the way, there's a big boss you need to fight before you actually get hell on. You <laughs> never mentioned that at all. <laughs> I know that. I can, I can tell into, like, uh, some kind of strange homage to the Terminator. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where he, I think the character's actually credited as a hunter, and 
he has to kill the female lead to, to pre- in this case, prevent the apocalypse, opposed to Terminator, is to prevent the apocalypse from being <laughs> stopped. Yeah. But why does he go after the wish? Why does he go after the djinn and kill him? Kill the djinn and then no more wishes. And it's the fact that it's like he turns up to stop the third wish being granted. But what if her wish was easy to grant? Yes, I. That's it. It's all over the place in terms of that because uh, his whole reason for being then would be null and void because if she, she said, "Oh, I want, I want a million dollars and a dog," and he's like, "And there you go, woof," you know. And <laughs> he would hardly, hardly have time to sort of appear in this realm before. You know, all hell broke loose. Literally, all hell broke loose. So yes, I exactly. And again, as, as I mentioned earlier, you can you can forgive plot holes and things not making sense if it's entertaining. You, don't, I'm not forgiving anything here. No, definitely not. That's they, they've had a problem with this film on how to end it, and they thought, well, what did they do previously? Oh, they brought an angel in. Let's just bring another something similar in and. Do that. Nobody's really going to watch this film anyway, so it'll be all right. It was that only person as well that thought he looks a bit like the guy in the previous movie. He did, yeah. It was <laughs> very similar to him, yeah. <laughs> Similar, it's similar look about him, similar build and everything. Yeah, I was just checking this guy's uh, filmography, and he's, he's he's actually done a lot in terms of being a working actor. He's most known for being a mutant X. Remember that show? Yes, I do. Yes, I. It was in that. It was in a few episodes in Charmed and Melrose Place later on. But before this movie, as you mentioned, the, the underwear model, it was in Baywatch Hawaii in a film called The Chippendales Murder. <laughs> <laughs> and there you go. Oh, it, oh it, was, it was in The Scorpion King 4 as well, and 3. Wow. Oh, Christ. <laughs> as long as he's getting work, that's the important thing. Yes, yeah, it seems to be. Oh, he was in that programme Continuum as well. That was a pretty decent sci-fi TV show. I think it was on here for a while, but it was, it was all right, yeah. I remember that. Don't really remember the guy being in it, though, unfortunately. Nah. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I really need to ask, but would you recommend this film to people you like, never mind people you don't like? No, I think Arthur Wishmaster 2. There's no point in watching 3 and 4. I mean, what we have discussed is this, the Hellraiser sequels, uh, about a slog they could be. But even at that point, you've went, and you know what, you've came as far as well just watching them. There's less movies here. Less than half in that franchise, and I would only recommend watching two out of the four of them. Same with the Hellraiser films, there's usually something that you can take away from them. Here, there was very little after the second film that you would you could take away at all. There was, there was more, far more wrong with it than there was right with it. It's, it, it. They weren't enjoyable watches, they weren't bad films you could enjoy watching, they were just bad films. No, just bad movies. And you're right, I think the big thing that's missing and to compare to Hellraiser. Or even like later Friday the Thirteenth, and Friday the Thirteenth, Nightmare on Elm Street movies, which are pretty terrible. You've still got Robert England, and you've still yes. got Doug Bradley. Now I know we haven't discussed Hellraiser nine and ten yet for the upcoming third part of our Hellraiser special, but when you've got a bad Hellraiser movie, you've still got Doug Bradley bringing something to you. A bad Nightmare on Elm Street movie, at least Robert England's there to keep your attention. Taking out Andrew Devoff and replacing them, nah, it's yeah, it was a very bad move. Really was, and you kind of think to yourself, if Andrew Devolf was in both these movies, a they'd have been totally different movies based on his style of acting and the way, the, the way he portrayed the character. They could have been more fun, more tongue in cheek. Instead, we get these dodges that are just really stony faced and straight laced. There's no fun to be had. No, not at all. It's like a bad soap opera. Yes, I and um, as you say, a lot of it was soap opera characters that seemed to be and it based on their filmography and that they came from soap backgrounds and went back to it. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing because you got an, an awful lot of good acting there, but yes, they were a bit rubbish, to be perfectly honest. Now, Andrew Devoff did express interest in coming back. I think he was interviewed in 2017 and he expressed interest in maybe coming back to the role. He acknowledged the fact that the films after he was involved in them weren't particularly good and I don't think anybody would argue with him. But he said that you would quite like to see where the story would go and obviously his character would go. So he's obviously trying to get a bit of work and everything. But yeah, would you watch something like that? Oh, 100%. If it was a crowdfunder, I'd donate money to it. <laughs> Well, why not, I suppose. So, as a franchise overall, it's kind of a 50-50 split, would you say? Very much so, yeah. Entirely straight down the middle. I would agree with that, yeah. Which is, 
fifty percent is okay, but you kind of want to be a bit more out of your horror franchises. Let's face it, don't you? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I've seen the first movie, and I think I've seen the second one before on Euros a three and four. And HMB or Virgin back in the day, seen the box set and went, yeah, I'll take a punt in that. And I remember being quite excited about seeing the other two. And it was, oh, there's good stuff with angels and that in it. And I love that kind of mythology aspect. And I was like, Jesus, he's under <laughs> these films fall off a, a serious cliff after the second one. I mean, I mean, to the point you kind of wonder, why did they even bother making them? Because clearly nobody in them seemed interested. Yeah. That sounds harsh. That sounds harsh. But I mean, watch them for yourself, people. Am I wrong? You're not wrong. Definitely not. And because these last couple were almost made for TV ones, then you've got no idea really how much they, they cost to make, how much they actually made in the reception, apart from what sort of critics, uh, polls and things like IMDb, which have not been particularly kind to them. So you, there, there must have been a reason behind making three and four. And obviously Wishmaster is a name, so therefore it's one that's ripe for a remake, given the fact that there are plenty of other films out there getting remakes. Obviously, you're looking at Halloween's been very successful. Candyman was due to come back just after the lockdown started, which obviously we've got that to look forward to. That looks pretty interesting, I thought. But Definitely. yeah, I, I, I think this is one that would be ripe for a wee reboot or a reimagining. Get some, maybe I think get so. some of the original people involved again, and it would be, it could be. Quite good. Maybe get a second film with uh, the, the lead character from the first film. See if she, she, she'll come back and reprise her role as well. I think she could. You know, maybe not necessarily as the, as the lead, but some kind of like a sage like figure who departs knowledge. Yes, yeah. I, that would kind of work. I'd watch that. And um, yeah, as you say, there's some of the other kind of franchise. Blumhouse. Blumhouse, if you're watching, <laughs> if, you know, if you're listening, which you know you yeah. are, yeah. I've had them go tweet them. See if they're up for it. I think they do, I think they do, I think they do great. Excellent. Help. Oh. We hope you enjoyed our Wishmaster special. If you've seen the movies, I'm sorry. If you haven't seen them, now you know what ones to watch. But I know what you like out there. You'll watch one and two, and you've attempted to watch three and four, and that's on you. We warned you. That's entirely on you. Well, as you know as well, cinemas have reopened up here, so we're going to get back to doing what we do best. We'll still record part three of our Hairbrother trilogy special, John. What films have you started to watch? I have still to watch the last four. I haven't seen oh. one. Seven, eight, nine, and ten. There's ten, isn't there, of them? Total? Yeah. Yes, yeah, I've still to watch the last four in preparation for this. I will get on to that with a certain amount of haste. So, <laughs> Because obviously our audience is clamouring for the third part of our Hellraiser discussion. So, yes, uh, I think it should. Uh, from what you've said and what you've hinted at i've got uh, quite a lot to look forward to it may not be all good but i've got a lot to look forward to which is interesting well i can assure you that the remaining here was a movies every single one of them is better than wishmaster three or four nice that's a good start as indeed well, thanks everybody for joining in john again thanks for your time yep. had a lot of fun had more fun more fun talking about wishmaster three and four than i did watching it trust me <laughs> <laughs> same yeah Thanks everybody. And remember, please like the podcast and subscribe to us. Leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts. You can find us on social media at Movie Scramble on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. You can email us the email address podcast at moviescramble.com. For fuck's sake, one day I'm going to get this damn email address right. If this was Wishmaster, I would say, I wish I got this email address right and my head would explode or something. So, you know how you get a hold of us. Please do. If there's any crazy, terrible horror franchise you would like to see us, you'd like to torture us with and put us through watching it, let us know. Anything for yourself, John? Any shout outs? No, not at the moment. I'm just really looking forward to getting back to cinemas in some capacity, which is long overdue. I am also looking forward to being able to talk about films that are coming out of the cinema as well, because that's always interesting when we, we get the whole gang together and are able to do that. So, yes. Good times ahead for everybody. Indeed. And everybody, please stay safe out there. Things are starting to return back to some kind of same normality, but the virus hasn't gone anywhere. So just be careful in how you go about your business. And please, for the love of God, wear a mask. Seconded, yes. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Good night. <laughs>